Okay, this is a piece of lapis lazuli that I had in my inventory from a larger piece that I, I trimmed this off of with my trim saw long, long time ago and then put it away and haven't looked at it since. It's uh, put a little bit of alcohol on it. It's good quality lapis in that there's not fractures in it and there's not a lot of pyrite in it. So it's mostly, you know, less pyrite. Although some people actually prefer having a lot of pyrite uh, gold specks in it. So it, on this side, there is some, some pyrite, not a lot. And not, like I said, not a lot of fracturing. So I'll uh, try to cut this into a piece of jewelry. I don't know if a gemstone, I guess, for Bopi. So years ago, when I was a paratrooper in the army, I was sent to Afghanistan just after the fall of the Taliban. And at that time, we were able to get around quite a bit, and I often visited several weekly bazaars. And at that time, I was able to obtain top quality lapis rough at very, very good prices. So I bought quite a bit of rough. Unfortunately, over time, each of the weekly bazaars that I attended, the lapis being offered became slightly lower quality, the pieces, slightly smaller and a few more fractures in the rough and the prices slightly higher than the previous weeks. So everything in the bazaar over time started to decline. So eventually I just stopped going to those bazaars. Um, so I don't know what the quality is of lapis being offered nowadays at the weekly bazaar to the tourists or coalition forces that visit them. But I suspect it's not as good as when I first, when we first went into Afghanistan. Although Afghanistan is the major location for top quality lapis in the world, large amounts of lapis have also been found in the Andes Mountains in Chile, as well as in Siberia and Russia. Smaller amounts of lapis come from Angola, Argentina, Myanmar, formerly Burma, Pakistan, Canada, India, Italy, and in the United States. Archaeologists have discovered that the uh, Sarisong mine in Afghanistan uh, was in operation during the 7th millennium BC and has produced some of the finest lapis in the world. Uh, in addition to gemstones, lapis was used in Europe to create the very finest and most expensive deep blue pigments for paint or dye. In ancient Egypt, during the time of the pharaohs, lapis was one of the most popular stones to be shaped and polished into amulets or scarabs. In fact, lapis and gold uh, were the main components in the burial mask of King Tutankhamun. Lapis uh, has a hardness scale of about 5 to 5.5 on the Mohs scale, which is around a little bit, little bit harder than apatite, which is not very hard. So I don't want to use a rough lap on this. So I'll probably start fastening, start cutting this with a 600 grit lap. But since I already have a flat spot here to mount it to the dop from when I used my trim saw, I'm not gonna, not gonna uh, have to grind a flat spot on it. I'll just use what I've got. And uh, so I'll mount this to the dop and we'll start cutting it. For this piece of lapis, I will cut the angel cross design by Jeff Graham. With this design, the top of the stone should look like this. Uh, with the dark blue being frosted facets, uh, the light blue being lighter frosted facets, and the white being polished facets. And since lapis is not transparent, you can't see through it, light won't reflect through it, so it doesn't matter what I do to the bottom part or pavilion of the stone. 
so I won't worry about the bottom part right now. Jeff put this design into the public domain back in 2002 for all gem cutters to use. In fact, he put about two dozen of his favorite designs into the public domain, and I explain in a video how to get those uh, designs from Jeff's now closed website. So if you're interested in Jeff's designs, take a look at this video and uh, it'll show you how to go back and download all the free designs by Jeff. Okay, for our uh, Lapis Lazuli to put it into our transfer jig, I put uh, a dot in the bottom. I put a piece of modeling clay here that'll help kind of form to the bottom side of the stone, which is not flat and help us make the top part, which is flat, line up with the top. I'm, so you put it in the uh, there and push down the top, get it straight. So now I'm using a larger dop than, I, this is not the dop I'm gonna use, smaller dop, I'm gonna use this dop. But using a larger dop at this point helps me center the stone to get it where I want it. So that is pretty much where I want the stone to be. So I push down on the transfer jig to help set the bottom part of the stone into the modeling clay. You can you know, push the modeling clay up a little bit. It'll help hold it in place as I move to the other dot that I'm gonna actually use. So then, then I remove this dot. slide in the dot that we're going to use and now we're ready to glue the dot to the stone so we'll get our two-part epoxy ready okay I use the back of a business card and a bamboo skewer that I bought a batch of at the grocery store for my two-part epoxy I use uh, Devcon this year It's a two-part, uh, a, a resin and a hardener, and uh, you just lay out two little puddles, kind of 50-50 mix. You just use your eyeball to get it close. It's not a problem if it's not exactly 50-50, so you don't need a measuring tool. That looks like it's about 50-50. So simply mix them together and then you have a couple of minutes to get the uh, uh, epoxy onto the stone before it sets up. Okay, so I just want to get a little bit of epoxy under the dot, between the dot and the stone and part way up the dot. Then I push the dot onto the stone, tighten it down, and I can add more adhesive if we need to. So I like it to be again part way up the dop and also onto the stone. Then I turn the transfer jig over and let gravity work um, so that the epoxy flows in both onto the stone and Part way down the dot. I don't let it don't let it go all the way down the dot, and don't let it go over the side of the stone. So you might have to move your transfer jig a, a couple of times as the uh, epoxy sets up. So then I let it set uh, overnight and harden, and the next day tomorrow I'll be able to cut our lapis. Okay, for our lapis, we set the tooth of our index at 96. And this is the up and down part of the cross, the bottom part down and the top part up. So we just orient our stone that way. 
probably want it like this. So we put it in uh, 96 and tighten it down. And then we're ready to start preforming our lapis. Okay, of course lapis is, is not transparent at all. It's not, a, you know, you can't see through lapis. So there's no need to cut the pavilion, except uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do a rough preforming of the pavilion so I get the cross lined up properly. I may come back later and just use step cuts and cut over whatever I do. But I'm gonna start on the pavilion to kind of get something near a center point so that I line up the cross properly. Okay, this is the pavilion of our lapis, the bottom half. So uh, it really doesn't matter that I cut these angles because the lapis is opaque. You can't see through it, so light won't refract, won't be reflected through the stone. So the, the facets on the bottom are not going to help reflect light through the stone at all. They're just there for one to line up the point, which the culet, which allows us to line up the angles, the four sides of the cross, once we transfer the stone to the crown. And uh, so I've already gone through my 12M and, and pre-polished uh, the stone. I just want to get a nice polish on it. So I certainly could go through my uh, Batlap, uh, 3000 grit diamond on a Batlap, and uh, then use something like cerium oxide on a tin lap or, you know, Aluminum oxide, I think cerium oxide works, I'd have to check. And then, or uh, 50,000 diamond on a bat lap. But when I use the diamonds on a bat lap or cerium oxide or aluminum oxide on, on the tin lap, it creates a kind of a slurry. And uh, lapis is porous. I mean, there's, so I'm worried that the slurry, the black slurry, especially with the 3000 grit, would get sucked into the stone. I don't want that. So instead, I'm gonna use my uh, lightning laps, which I haven't used in a while. I'm gonna pull them out of the toolbox. So I've already used a 1500 grit. The 12M is about a 1500 grit. So I'll use uh, my Delight's uh, lightning laps. Uh, they won't, they won't cut, put any slurry on the stone. So I use the 3,000, the 8,000, 14,000, and the 50,000. And that should put a nice, uh, a nice polish on our lapis without making any slurry that gets sucked into the stone. Let's see how this turns out. Okay, for our lapis lazuli, here's where we are. We had a problem. So in this piece of rough, before I started cutting, there was a fracture line here. And what happened is as I was cutting, it broke out. So this is the bottom part, the pavilion. What are the options? Well, again, the stone is opaque, so it doesn't really matter about the bottom part. There's no light gonna reflect through it. So you could actually leave it uh, and go on. Or I could cut the bottom flat, just make it a flat, uh, one giant flat facet all the way down. Cause again, it, it's not gonna make any difference on the stone that uh, light cannot pass through. Or I can continue along and uh, polish up all these facets and then transfer the stone and since these are all, all the facets meet at the center point, then that means I've got the angles for the cross and the outline for the girdle all set up. So I, I could transfer it and on the crown part, cut the girdle uh, smaller until I cut in far enough to get rid of this problem. That's going to make the stone a lot smaller. So those are the the options. Or if I was going to grind the top down to a flat facet, I could just grind it down, 
and turn this into the top. After, because I've, after I've ground it down, I've gotten rid of that fracture for the most part. And I could just cut the stone with this being the top, turn the bottom into the top, and then the top will become the bottom is already flat. That might be what I do. That just might be the right answer. Because that'll get rid of the uh, this other fracture, which runs uh, right along here. Goes down slightly here, but it, it, it'll uh, as I cut the sides, that get rid of that. That might be the best course of action. Okay, so as the bottom becomes the top and the top becomes the bottom on our stone because of the fracture that that popped out, what I seen, I've already you know started the first facet on the crown and. I want to work out and cut out this fracture line that goes around the stone. I had originally thought by putting it on the bottom of the stone it wouldn't be a problem, but now I think I should have taken the original piece of rough to my trim saw and got rid of the fracture line then and not had to worry about it because it's not good when the stone chips off in the middle of, of cutting it. So. I brought the girdle down from this level down to this level with the first facet. And the reason is, is because this fracture line goes around and comes down on the side. to About here and then goes back up. So I'm going to have to cut the girdle down to about here, which is fine, because that still leaves me a uh, bottom part of the stone. And all I have to do is just change the design on the bottom. It doesn't matter because uh, light doesn't pass through it. So I'll probably change the bottom to a step design. I've already got, fortunately, before the fracture occurred, we had already set the center point. So the shape of the stone is already set up for the for the cross design. Everything is aligned perfectly because we were able to make that permanent center point before disaster happened in it and a piece of the rock chipped out. So I think I'm gonna be able to not lose any size. I'm not gonna to have to cut in on the girdle, so I won't lose any size on the stone, but just uh, did a flip-flop and the bottom became the top and the top becomes bottom. Okay, I've worked through uh, the first uh, four uh, instructions, lines of instructions for the crown. About, you know, I there's 13 lines, so I've still got a long ways to go to work around the stone. However, just with our uh, you know, 300 series uh, topper lap, we've already worked this fracture so that the only thing left of it is right here and there it comes down right there and goes back up and completes a circle so we we will work this out we just have to come down a little further in the girdle and uh, we're going to end up with a uh, piece of lapis of this size with no fractures in it so I guess it could have been a, a good thing that that uh, one piece of fractured uh, lapis popped out. We'll see. So I've gone over the uh, lapis with the 600 grit diamond, uh, the topper, and uh, cleaned up the the fracture. It's gone now, so we've cut below that, and so it's all gone. So this will produce a stone that has no fractures in it. It's about two millimeters on the pavilion. So I could just finish the, the crown up and not worry about the pavilion, but I'll probably, I'm thinking I'm gonna go back and at least do one row of stair steps, step cuts, and uh, see how that works. But we'll, we'll get to that later. So I've done the 600 grit on the 
face of the stone, the, the crown. And I'll leave that as the frosted part. So all the outside of the cross, I'll leave that with a 600 grit finish, make it look frosted. And now I'll work on the cross itself with a 12M and then polish it up. So it'll be, the cross will be polished and the background around the cross will be frosted. We'll see how that turns out. Okay, I just finished uh, pre-polishing the cross part of our stone with a 3000 grit uh, lightning lap. Those are kind of a, a matrix uh, laps by delight. 3000, they're different. They're all color coded and they go from 3000, well they go from six, up, up to 50,000. So, so I'm gonna use those because I don't want any of the slurry um, when you work, work with the uh, uh, diamond with a bat lap or any of the other metal laps to get sucked into this stone, which is a little bit porous. So I'm gonna polish the cross. So I frosted the background with a 600 grit diamond and then I semi-frosted, a little less frosting, but still frosted the triangle here at each of the corners of the cross with a about a 1500 grit lap, my, my 12M. So two different types of frosting, a darker frosting, a lighter frosting down here. Everything else I'm gonna polish. So I'll go to through my uh, lightning laps uh, up to 50,000 diamond and polish up the uh, cross. Okay, I finished polishing the face of our lapis lazuli. I just finished up with the table and I polished the table first with a pre-polishing with a 600 grit topper and then I used my uh, delights, my lightning laps and just walked through the, uh, the series of them. I used my 1200, the 3000, 3, skipped the 8,000, went to the 14,000, and then the 50,000 diamond lightning laps. They work great. I'm glad I pulled them out of the box. I haven't used them in a while. They're a wonderful lap. I don't have anything bad to say about them. And they did the job here. So now I'll transfer my lapis. And although I could just call it done at this time, I'm going to transfer and take a look at the bottom side. I think I'm going to put a a step on there, I'm, I'm not sure. Let me take a look, so we're gonna transfer it anyway. Okay, I've removed our lapis from the top and uh, I wanna line it up so the top half matches the bottom half and they're both in alignment. So the longest facet on the girdle is that uh, P9 instruction at the uh, 16 and 80 tooth. So I set the tooth at the 16 tooth and uh, the angle at 90 degrees. And then I just run the stone down until it's flat uh, with our piece of uh, calibrated metal. And I check that there's no, that it's, that it's both sides touch the metal at the same time as I'm going down and I check that the other side is in fact 80 and it is so I didn't put it in backwards which could happen so just tighten it up and we're ready to start cutting the upper well in this case the lower half of our stone okay for our lapis I'm gonna leave a, a five 0.5 millimeter girdle. So the pavilion's not gonna be much anyway, but since light doesn't go through it, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm gonna cut at a 45 degree angle down to a 0.5 millimeter girdle, and then I'll probably just uh, clean up the table, the cut the table, the, I guess it's the table of the pavilion. And uh, so I'll go all the way around with this. So to measure my girdle at a 0.5 millimeter, I've been using my newest uh, toy uh, uh, LED uh, scale loop. So it's uh, a 10 power loop. 
with a uh, reticle, reticle scale in lens you can put on the end and uh, it's super I mean I like it I like it a hundred percent better than my old uh, steel gauge where I used to line up the gap in a point zero point three that gap would I'd line that up against the girdle or a point five is right here I had to have rubbed off all the paint from the years of use so my new tool I like it like it just reporting back to you that I like it and if you want to see more about it I did a, a video on the girdle so you can take a look at it and the reticle scale now here's the video where I explain all about my new loop with the reticle scale which I use to measure the girdle thickness. Take a look if you're interested on how the reticle scale works to measure girdles. The angel cross design works well with stones like lapis because the frosted facets and polished cross stand out uh, on this stone for one because you can't see through it and also for two because that deep beautiful blue color just looks great in the lapis color. Um, I don't cut a lot of non-transparent gemstones, but I don't mind cutting a lapis once in a while. But as a general rule, I leave lapis to the cabin community as